Thank you so much for tuning in and welcome to Serve's podcast series. The podcasts are brought to you by Serve at UNC Greensboro. We are a university-based center with over three decades of experience working with educators and policymakers to improve education. These podcasts highlight conversations on various topics ranging from early childhood education to high school reform with a lens on equity. My name is Sana Silvera Roy, a communication specialist at SIR, and I will be your host today. All podcasts will be archived and found on SIRV's website, serve.org. Today's podcast is episode two of SIRV's three-part series discussing the topic of early college high schools and its impact on post-secondary outcomes. In episode one, Dr. Julie Edmonds, the director of the Early College Research Center at UNC Greensboro, and Matt Bristow-Smith, the principal at Edgecombe Early College High School, offered a discussion on the introduction to research, implementation, and equity practices that are in place to increase student success in early college high schools. Each episode is a conversation between Julie and Matt, who offer their perspectives from the research side and the practitioner side of early college high schools. Today's episode will continue that conversation with a discussion on school supports needed for positive student impacts. Please take a listen. Let's talk a little bit about what the impacts are of early college. So our data shows that uh, students who graduate from early college is much more likely to earn any sort of post-secondary credential, particularly an associate degree, you know, two to three times more likely to earn an associate degree. They're slightly more likely to earn a bachelor's degree, so not huge impacts, but at least you're seeing ad- those additional credentials are really around the, the associate degree. Uh, we do see larger impacts for low-income students in particular. So for low-income students, those are the ones that are really benefiting in the four-year degree. So they're um, significantly more likely to get a four-year degree after. Uh, what are the... What do you see from the students who graduated from your early college? I assume you keep in touch with some Mm. of them or they keep in touch with you. (laughs) And so uh, what do they tell you about how prepared they were in in college and um, or whatever their next step was? Sure. Great question, Julie. The you know, and it's tough sometimes to paint with a broad brush when we talk about outcomes for for students at our school. But what I will say is that when we look at our data, what we see is at Edgecombe Early College, a greater persistence rate through the first year of college and a, as you said, a slightly greater rate of students uh, achieving their bachelor's degrees. So fundamentally, I think one of the things that that makes our early college work is that at the core focus of our early college is that we differentiate, we personalize, and we we build super strong relationships with these students. And so those relationships do carry beyond graduation and, and into young adulthood. In fact, our school system's mission is that we support kids all the way through age 25, because we know that your need for support doesn't begin before you get to high school, and it really doesn't begin after you, or doesn't end rather after you graduate from high school. Students we have coming back to us talk with us about their levels of readiness for taking university classes because they have already earned 60 college credits of community college classes. They talk with us about their ability to manage their time, about their ability to um, handle stress and to navigate uh, the changing world that they're in. We hear a lot of conversations about long-term goals that they're working towards and the short-term steps they're taking to reach those goals. In general, what we, we sense from our students as a, one of the important outcomes is that they're not just college ready and career ready, but we sense that they are more life ready. A lot of our students that, that graduate leave us, many of them leave us with full scholarships to college. Many of them leave us going into community colleges where the Longleaf Pine Promise um, grant is there to support them academically. Many of them do go into the military. We do have a handful that go straight into the workforce. But whatever path they choose, what we know is that when they graduate from us, that path has already been set into motion and they already have the wind at their back and there's a momentum. In a traditional environment, often what we hear from students is I graduated and then I needed to figure out what I was going to do next. At our school, that what am I going to do next after school is baked into the conversations and supports they have their super senior year when they graduate. So outcomes, both tangible and data specific, but also more human and more personal is that our students are able to land on their feet and ready to kind of take the world by storm. I will say that I agree. And I think our 
research really supports this idea that they have a better sense of what they want to do. So we see when we look at students who graduate and go on to a four-year that they're actually less likely to switch majors. So they have a better sense of what they want to do. They're able to take more advanced courses. And when we talk to them, we don't get as much of a chance to talk to them as, as you all do. And I miss that. But when we do talk to them, they will say, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. And I can't believe these other students that are sort of flailing around in college. And they, and they, they see their friends sort of really struggling a lot more um, because they didn't have that exposure to careers and to sort of general kind of future planning, I think, that you all get in mm-hmm. the early colleges. So. Yeah. So, Julie, to support that, what I would I'd share is that really from the, the, the junior year to the senior year to the super senior year, some of our major focuses are about helping kids to explore, right? To explore the world of work, to explore the world of college, to do self-exploration. And so our students at our school especially take uh, the junior year and they do career interest inventories. They complete a 20-hour internship working in the world of work or in the world of uh, nonprofit or the world of the the community. That's every student. Every one of our juniors completes a real-world internship. And then they go through the Buck Institute project-based learning piece. They actually do a public presentation of their learning and a reflection. And at the end of that, some students have said, gosh, this is exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Others are like, wow, that was a really valuable experience, but it's not what I want to do with my life. And both of those are really useful outcomes. Their senior year, they complete a senior project. And the senior project is like a passion project that allows them to drive their own learning through the course of their senior year. It involves some research. It involves a portfolio of learning. They have a mentor that they work with. Um, They do, again, a public presentation of their learning. And again, it's an opportunity for them to get to know themselves and to build their muscle for making decisions and having a sense of agency about their learning. By the time they get to their super senior year, students have had a chance to explore. They may need to do additional exploration. And we, of course, support that. But But when they graduate from us, one of the overwhelming senses that we have from students is that I have been, I've learned not just in school, but I've learned out of school. I feel comfortable moving from one system to another system, right? Whether that's a school system or it's a world of work or the military, I'm I'm comfortable learning to navigate the world. One of the big pieces for us at our school is that we try to help students learn to advocate for themselves. And so that doesn't mean that the role of the parent or the guardian is less important. It just means that we try to build students' voice to be their primary advocate while they're in school. We have some mechanisms I can share about how we do that. But that's so important because rather than students in a system that is treating them as an automaton, our system treats them as an individual. And by the time they graduate, there's really like a three-prong focus. And I like to just kind of share these three prongs. The first is that we have mastered some academic learning, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, remediation from uh, learning gaps we got from middle school, or it's learning some academic content in high school, or it's earning 60 college credits, like academic mastery is really important. But the second one that's really important that can sometimes get lost is this idea of identity. So the work we do, we try to make it as relevant as possible. We want students to have voice and choice in driving their learning. And so that the work that they do helps to contribute to their sense of self. And then the third piece, which is also very important, um, and Ken Robinson would say is grossly lacking from so much of our public school system, is this idea of creativity. So students need to be able to be masters of their own learning. They need to be able to facilitate their own learning, and they need to be able to learn with their teachers as facilitators rather than just vessels upon whom learning is poured into, and they, they master that content, and they sort of regurgitate that back out on an assessment. Students need to be able to create their own paths in life. And so these three ideas really do drive a lot of our work, the mastery, the identity, and the creativity, and then take into that a healthy dose of individualization and personalization. And our greatest goal is that when students graduate from us ready for what comes next, that they have some confidence that they are in the driver's seat of their learning. That idea of identity is really interesting to me. We did. We have been able to talk to a lot of students who are in high school, so in a range of early colleges across the state. And one always stands out to me. So he was a um, so African American male had had really struggled through middle school. Had um, actually gotten kicked out. Had to go to a private school. Smart, smart, smart young man. Um, was 
in fights and things like that. But the early college principal saw something in him. And so she she's like, yeah, I think you can be successful. And uh, and so we we interviewed him. He was in his junior year, I think. And he said he first got to the early college and he really um, he would try to start things with other kids. You know, he would because that was sort of the way that he had learned to deal with students. And he was like, he said, yeah, you know, he said, nobody would fight with me. He said it really wasn't a good look in the school. It just wasn't sort of an acceptable behavior in that school. And so he was able at that point to shift and really have much more academic focus. And so by the time his junior year, you know, I think he struggled. He had some academic struggles his first two years. And then he he's like, now I got I to gotta do this. And so his junior year, I think he was taking 80 credit hours or something like that in the college. And he had just really changed his whole life. And he would talk about this, the other kids who had been, were still in his old neighborhood. And he's like, you know, I said, kids are getting shot. You know, I've had friends who died. And, um, and for him, the early college was really a- allowed him to express the academic side that he had always had. It was just in his regular high school or in the middle school experience, students didn't let him demonstrate that. There was a lot of peer pressure to not do well in school and to not be academically focused. And so the early college um, really helped him get that more academic focus. Julie, the thing I would share about that is that it's so important for people to understand, parents, students, school leaders, that early colleges are really not about taking your eighth grade students that are super high performing and then putting them in an environment that is also super high performing and accelerating their learning so that they are even more performing. Basically, what I'm trying to emphasize is that it's not really a model that's intended to take the privileged, make them more privileged, and then to make their outcomes even more privileged. Our model is really designed and properly designed to support students that may need a fresh start. My goal at our school is that I'm able to look at an eighth grade student who has a C minus average and has 15 absences and a history of discipline incidents like the one you described, and that for that student to come to our school and participate in our transition program over the summer, hit the ground running in August, and have an incredible five years that's unlike anything he or she or they could possibly have imagined. If our school is able to do that, then I'm able to, with confidence, sleep at night knowing that I have served and that we have served all students. But if our school is not able to do that, the disconnect isn't with the student. The disconnect is with the school. Our school has to be a system that supports individuals. And I'm not about to look at, you know, an eighth grade student who has had incredible challenging life circumstances and say that their deficits won't make them successful in our environment. So your story of that individual you just described is one that um, certainly resonates with me. And one of the ways that we find that students land on their feet and that they have an incredible high school experience at the early college is because we recognize them as the people that they are. We don't in any way try to forget the past. We don't try to look at the past as a deficit. Everything is a growth experience. Everything is part of developing you into the person that you're supposed to be. And so you're perfect now and you're going to be more perfect later. And the the goal is like, let's grow together in that process. In fact, I'll share that our school motto at Edgecombe Early College is five words, be yourself, leave completely changed. And that's really about validating you for who you are and recognizing that our school is going to be a place that's going to help to grow you into exactly the person that you want to be or that you could be. One of the non-negotiables of an early college model is that the high school is partnered with an institution of higher education, be it a community college or a four-year college, a public or private. And in North Carolina, almost all of our early colleges are embedded on the campus of a higher uh, of an institution of higher education. So that's clearly one of the non-negotiables. The second non-negotiable here in North Carolina is that our schools are going to be small. So the each grade level can have in North Carolina no more than 100 students per grade level, which means the largest early colleges in our state may be four to 500 students. Our school in Edgecombe is much smaller because our facilities are smaller and our staff is smaller. But that small scale is so important because when you're thinking about innovation, our schools need to be able to respond to conditions on the ground like a speedboat rather than an ocean liner, which was incredibly helpful during the pandemic when we were trying to scale up remote learning. And that's a, another story, perhaps for another time or for later in this conversation. Early colleges need to be autonomous. 
they are not embedded as part of a traditional high school. They're not embedded as part of another program. Early colleges are autonomous. They have their own principal. They have their own counseling office. Many of them, like our school, have a college liaison, a, an officer who serves as the bridge between our high school and the college. And then we need to have our own staff that, that help to build that. At our school, another piece that's non-negotiable is that we have advisories at every grade level. So grade nine, grade 10, 11, 12, and 13, we have advisories that help to shepherd students through the particular challenges of that of their age level. And so those advisories are really important. And then there are certain design models. Here in North Carolina, we have a design and implementation guide for early colleges that have certain criteria in that a design guide that help us to shape the kind of work that we do. Julie, is there anything you would want to add to the non-negotiables for the model? So I would say that there's a surprising continuity in early colleges across the country when they're implemented at the state level. So for example, Texas has a blueprint for early colleges. It includes a lot of the components that you were talking about. I would add to that that there's this um, focus on a underrepresented uh, or underserved student. So there's a target population for the early colleges. There's also, uh, the, the size can vary, and in some states, actually, there are programs within larger early colleges, I mean, sorry, with, uh, early college programs that occur within larger comprehensive high schools, and that, for example, we see a lot in Michigan. So there are other states that are trying out sort of these different models and different ways of doing things. There's the curriculum. So the curriculum needs to be structured in such a way that the students can receive enough college credits to receive their associate's degree and that they also get enough high school credit so that they can graduate from high school. So that's a, obviously a core part of it. And then the supports piece, which we've talked about already, is that there needs to be those supports in place. And then different states will have different ideas about how important things like instruction are. A lot of states will also pay attention to the experience of the adults in the school. And so where it's really an opportunity to um, make sure that the adults have the professional development they need, that there's a lot of collaboration, and that there's really a lot of use of data to make sure that they're tracking their students' performance and know where students are at all time. And that's part of that personalization piece, too, is that use of data. I think we have 122 early colleges in North Carolina, 133 other schools that are part of a, of a network that we have here for innovative high schools, but about 120, 122 of those are early colleges. And I think if you walked into all of those 122 schools, you would see that each one's different, you know, responding to the unique context that they're in. But the target population that Julie just mentioned, uh, first generation college students, students who are at risk of dropping out or students who are in need of acceleration, that is, you know, one of the core focuses of all of those early colleges in the state. And the design piece might change a little bit from community to community. But I think ultimately the focus is let's create models that are as inclusive as possible of the wide range of student needs in our state and then set them on a path. And this is powerful, you guys. Set them on a path where while they're in high school, they can earn a community college credential like an associate's degree or a CTE certificate without having to transition to another school. I really can't emphasize enough that that integrated model works especially well for families that are perhaps marginalized by the traditional school system or by other institutions in their community and that who can get their kids into ninth grade and then be supported through graduation to earn two credentials. Our families on graduation day celebrate like crazy because they are celebrating students that have done something that sometimes no one else in their family has done. And our graduations are so celebratory because it's really a double graduation. It's a double whammy. In fact, in, in Edgecombe, our students graduate from the community college first, then they graduate from high school. <laughs> we actually graduate from high school after the community college graduation. But that high school graduation piece is attended by our community college president. It's, it's attended by his leadership. There is this sense that our students have really done something remarkable because the design of the school, you know, design is our activism. Design is the key to making sure that students see themselves in school, they're on a pathway, they're supported, and ultimately they really don't have much choice but to graduate from us with an associate's degree or a CTE credential because the system is designed to do that. And that's, I think, why you see that huge impact on associate degrees is, I mean, it's baked into the system, so they don't have as much choice. 
part of what we do build over the course of the five years is the grit and the resilience to spring back from you know the the micro failures along the way that are inevitably going to happen because life doesn't always go the way you hope it will but when students are receiving supports that are real time and that are responsive to their individual needs and those supports are layered in with unconditional love and i can't emphasize that enough that as the school dad for these students i love them unconditionally the good the bad the the ugly all of that is part of being a school dad for these students and when they experience adversity or when they experience the inevitable setbacks that are going to happen what they know is that the safety net is there to catch them and then get them back on their feet okay it's not a deficit it's just life and our system is is uniquely designed i think to support them as the individuals that they are so i would just say that every and this is powerful every single student in my school i know by their first name i know something about them i know their family i know their grandma half of them i taught their parents and every single teacher in my school knows the name of every single student at our school if you're going to succeed at our school you're going to do it with the support of our entire school behind you and if you're going to experience setbacks and failures, you're going to have an incredible network there to catch you. But no student, no student is anonymous. And I want to emphasize that. No student succeeds or fails anonymously at our school. And I think that's a real power. I think that's really what we see in the data that we've collected also. So we've been able to collect survey data and, uh, again, as I mentioned, do a lot of interviews. And we hear the word family coming up a lot. You know, they'll talk about the early college as so a third as a, word in my mission statement, Julie, as family. A family, as a family. And so they really see that and, and feel that. And, and that goes across early college. You know, when we go talk to students in early colleges, when we looked, when we did the surveys, we found that students in our treatment group, so these were students who applied to get it, to get into an early college, went through a lottery and were randomly accepted to attend. And then we have our control group, which is students who applied, went through a lottery and were not accepted. And so went back to the, the regular high school. And so we did surveys of both groups of students. And what we saw is that students in the early college reported significantly higher levels of support. They report. Uh, they reported significantly higher relationships with their teachers, at least until they started taking mostly college courses. And then, and then I think those relationships, the relationships were ma- remained with the with their high school teachers, but the relationships with the college teachers weren't necessarily as strong because they were obviously going out into a regular college setting. But they had significantly high, higher quality relationships, and so so it's definitely something that we see is showing up in the data. So I think it's not. It's not just your unique school, even though your school is great, I think, but it's it's actually somewhat typical of what we see in terms of really having that that strong, the strong relationships. And the other thing that I want to mention, which is something that you keep bringing up too, and it's one of my sort of um, little theories, is that it feels like early colleges, the staff in early colleges have what we consider a collective responsibility for all the students in the school. And that's what you were just talking about, too, where you know the names of everyone. All the staff knows the names of everyone. If someone's going to be walking down the, the hallway and, you know, not behaving the way they need to be behaving, everyone is going to feel comfortable and saying, hey, you know, what's up? What are you doing? And I think that's very different from a regular high school where oftentimes teachers because they're so large sometimes, but they oftentimes feel like they only have responsibility for the kids that are in their individual class. And they may not necessarily have responsibility for the rest of the kids in the school. And so this idea of collective responsibility sort of feels very important and feels like a core factor of the success, underlying the success of early colleges. I do think that you, you pointed to something that is, um, I think, critical, and that is that the, the size of the school, sometimes uh, the economy of scale of the school can sometimes allow Um, certain conditions to exist that may not be possible in a larger high school. And having taught at a larger high school, I can speak to that. You know, I have twice as much experience as a teacher in a larger high school than I do as a principal in a smaller early college. But as I shared earlier, we have just finished our freshman transition week, which we call Bridge Week, with all of our incoming students in the class of 2027. And so these 40 students that were we spent a whole week with, we did a parent orientation with them, campus tour, 
They spent time in all of our classrooms. We spent three days doing um, team building with them and learning each other's names. We took them on a college tour to East Carolina University. We did team building at ECU with ECU staff. Ultimately, they spent a whole week at our school before the regular school year begins. And the reason that I'm sharing that is that every single one of my staff members was there, was involved in onboarding those students to the school. And so to your point about collective responsibility, even my junior and senior teachers where they're supporting these eighth grade students who are transitioning into ninth grade. They know these kids now. And so when kids are joining a family, they're truly joining a family. And when school starts for us this year, our kids will come into our school and they will know every single name of every single one of their classmates, even though they came from six different feeder patterns in Edgecombe County, they will know the names of every single one of their peers. When they sit down in their classrooms and it doesn't matter which classroom they're in, they will know the name of that teacher that's in that room. They will know me as a school principal because I've spent somewhere around 40 hours with them this past week. They'll know my college liaison. They'll know my scholar engagement coordinator. They'll know my, my counselor. They have my cell phone number. They have the, the phone numbers of all of our uh, staff members. We have mechanisms in place to create interactive communication between them and their families, not just one way between us and the school. And the point is that learning will happen on the first day of school. The transition to school will have occurred before the school year began. And it will continue, obviously, during the first few months of school, but we can start learning on the very first day of school. When I'm hiring people to come into our school environment, one of my most important screeners is that I need to make sure that the folks that I'm hiring understand that they are change agents. I need for them, aside from their credentials in college or their academic backgrounds, even their professional work histories, I need to hire folks whose hearts and minds are fully committed to being the change agent for students. So that when a student is in your classroom, you're not just responsible for teaching, you're responsible for learning, you're responsible for personal growth, you're responsible for support, you're responsible for building relationships with families, you're responsible for being a member of a team. And that kind of collective energy in a school is really powerful. We did find that new, so early college Early colleges were more likely to have novice teachers, but that the turnover for those teachers was actually less. And so I haven't lost a staff member in three years, Julie. Yeah. Yeah. And I will. And that's going through the pandemic. One of the things that we've learned from our research, too, is that uh, this all of these sort of factors together contribute to creating a culture of what we have called mandated engagement which essentially means that the students, uh, they'll, they'll tell you they can't hide. They're like, you know, <laughs> I remember talking to one young lady and we would ask some questions about, you know, well, uh, what would have happened to you if you were in a regular high school? And this particular um, young lady said, well, I would have dropped out. And I'm like, well, why haven't you dropped out here? And she's like, oh, they won't let me. It's so, <laughs> it's, I can't, you know, she's like, it's just easier to stay in school. So, um, so essentially, there's this idea, I think, that, that everything that you're doing is making students stay engaged in school. They're having to learn. They can't hide. They, and it's all related to everything that you've talked about so far, which is some of those relationships, um, the fact this collective responsibility, and the instructional practices that are going on. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so students have to be engaged and they and they have to feel like they have to be a part of this learning environment. Yeah. Julie, I have a rising senior at my school who called me two years ago during the pandemic and she said, Mr. Smith, my brother and I got into some trouble last Friday and law enforcement got involved and I'm going to have to report to court. And so I know I've let you down. I know I've let our school down. I know I'm not a good representative of the early college. And so I've decided to transfer to a traditional school. And I just mentioned that girl's a rising senior at our school now, two years later. I said, no. I said, you're not allowed to transfer out. This, The fact that you care enough about our school that you feel like you didn't meet our expectations tells us that you have internalized our expectations. And I do think that... You know, Todd Whitaker, the you know, education guru who has meant so much to, to classroom teachers and to school leaders across our state, Todd Whitaker talks about really three big things that impl- influence classroom success. And he also, I think these three things also influence school success in an early college. And one of those is the relationships, which you and I've already talked about. But the other two we haven't spoken quite so much about, at least not explicitly. And the second one is expectations. We have really high expectations for students. And when we think about equity, 
equity is not about lowering expectations so everyone can reach them. It's about maintaining really high expectations and then providing supports so that all students can reach those expectations. And the third piece is consistency. The school, a school, needs to be consistent so that students know how to navigate their experience. Parents understand how to navigate that experience. And the path that we set forward doesn't have so many zigs and zags and, and, and backs and forth and ups and downs in them. Students need to understand where they are in our plan and to be able to count on us to be there to support them all along the way. I do think that, you know, the phrase mandated engagement, you know, non, non-negotiable, unconditional engagement is true. And, you know, the early college is such an opportunity. It is such an opportunity, such a responsibility that we don't want a single second to go by that we waste, you know, with the students. So, Yeah. I think you're spot on there, Julie. I think one thing I might add to what you just said is also flexibility. And you talked a little bit about this earlier, is that the early college, unlike some of the larger schools, there's flexibility to meet students where they are and to accommodate their individual needs. So you're a five-year program, but you probably have, have you ever had a student graduate in three years? No. Um, okay. Because there are some, you know, there are some early colleges where I've seen a student graduate within three years with two associate degrees, for example. So like these are students who are just ready to go. They take summer classes They're, you know, and so the school kind of got out of their way (laughs) and let them do what they were able to do. Right. And what they wanted to do. And so, but I'm sure you've got students graduating four years. Oh, sure. Regularly. And so, and so it is about, I think there's that flexibility and that ability to accommodate students who, um, who are on different paces. Yeah. Um, and the thing I would say, Julie, is that, and, you know, I had a 12-year-old student who came in in ninth grade, you know, and he's at NC State right now. I just spoke to him last week. And you're right that the the flexibility is kind of baked into what we do, right? And, and certainly, I think many early colleges across the state graduate students in four years. Many of us graduate them in five years. Because of some of the instructional pieces that I've built into the school in ninth grade and 10th grade, 11th grade and 12th grade, we're not in a huge hurry. And I think sometimes we do accelerate and expedite and graduate students who are, you know, 18 years old with two associate's degrees and I'm going off to a four-year university. And there's a part of me that says, well, you know, what's the rush, right? I mean, there is a part of me as a school dad that says whether you're 18 or 19 and you're, you know, what's the rush? And I don't see the timeline as being one of my non-negotiables or one of my imperatives to graduate you as soon as I possibly can. In fact, one of the reasons that we moved to a five-year model at our school was because what we were seeing when I came on board was students getting to their fourth year of school and they were completing their high school graduation requirements. They were completing their college graduation requirements. They were completing their senior project. They were working a job. They were applying for college. They were applying for FAFSA. They were applying for scholarships. Many of them were doing it by themselves without any parent support at home. And we were finding that they were getting across the finish line in four years but we're really often tired and burned out, you know, and sometimes we saw their data drop, like their GPAs would sometimes drop in that last semester and they were just exhausted when they graduated. Yeah. I think it's, it's really about trying to meet the students where they are and accommodate where they want to go. It has been a very insightful discussion on school supports needed for positive student impacts in early college high schools. Join us next time for episode three, the final episode in the series, as Julie and Matt discuss the lessons learned and future plans for early college high schools. From all of us here at Serve to all of you, thank you for spending this time with us. Until next time.